This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am where the Word says I am. I am seated right now in the heavenly realms in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today my mind's alert. My spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better. And I will never, 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 never. I'm going to get those Bibles up. Let me see those. You have Bibles this morning. Say, never, never, never. never. Be the same again. Give someone else a high five, and then you may be seated this morning. We've been in this series, How to Write Your Own Ticket with God, and we've been saying that there's four steps to receiving your miracle. And we're going to start this morning in an Old Testament story to see a miracle in 2 Kings chapter 6. So if you want to turn your Bibles there to 2 Kings chapter 6. How to write your own ticket with God. Four steps. They are say it. Everybody say say it. Say it. Do it. Do it. Receive it. Receive it. And tell it. Do that one more time. Say say it. Say it. Do it. Do it. Receive it. Receive it. And tell it. Tell. Now shout this out loud. Shout nothing is too hard for God. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Shout it again. Shout, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. Luke chapter 18, verse 27, Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Everybody say, with God. With God. Now shout it out like you mean it. Shout, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard. You know, sometimes you just got to shout that out in your own home. Am I the only one that talks to myself? <laughs> You're like, no. And how many of y'all know when you talk to yourself, I mean, you got to gotta say the right things. Because you can talk yourself out of the answer pretty quick. And so you gotta, you gotta, sometimes you got to remind yourself, nothing is too hard for God. And you got to shout it out, nothing is too hard for God. Shout it one more time. Shout, nothing is too hard for God. And that's what I want to share with you this morning, that nothing is too hard for God. We're going to read in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 24. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. Now, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of cab of seed pods for five shekels. So what we see here, the, the background of where we are in this passage is that there was an ancient siege upon Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you read the, the back context of this, uh, several years before that, they had also come after them. And the, the prophet at the time was Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha. And Elisha, by the word of the Lord, tre treated them well, gave them food and all kinds of things, and sent the Syrian army off. Well, several years later, apparently they've forgotten about that kindness because they come back, and now they have a siege on the city, and there's such a siege on the city, such a famine on the city, that people were starving to death. They were selling donkey's heads. Now, I've never had a donkey head. <laughs> And really, in the Jewish tradition, donkey head, that would be something that's unclean. And obviously, a head doesn't have much meat on it anyways. So they're selling donkey heads and seed pods as if it was something to be desired. So you know that it was a desperate time when this is happening. You think, you, you think the situation you're in is desperate? Think about this situation. It was so desperate that they, people were also engaging in cannibalism. As a matter of fact, they were eating their own children. Let's read on in verse 26. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord the king. 
The king replied, if the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? Some help, huh? From the, from the threshing floor, from the wine press. Then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. Wow. Everybody say, wow. wow. That's what I love about the Bible is the Bible tells the truth. And the Bible tells the way it really was, what was really going on. So, I mean, imagine you going in a pact with your neighbor and saying, you know, we'll eat my child today, but we'll eat your child tomorrow. So you cook your child and eat. And then the next day you go, okay, it's time to eat again. And she acts like she doesn't know where her child is. She hid her child. I mean, imagine the agony. Imagine the guilt. Imagine how this woman felt. So the desperation was so bad that they were eating their own children and other people's children. Now, this was not a result of God, but this was a result of disobedience of the people. But this disobedience of the people and this anger became directed at God and the man of God. Look at verse, look back at verse 30. He said, uh, look at verse 30. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked, and there, underneath, he had a sackcloth on his body. He said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Sephat, remains on his shoulders today. So what does he immediately direct his anger at? The man of God which is a byproduct of directing it really where? To God. to God, right? Now, there's a proverb that deals with this, and this is something that I've seen in ministry over many years, and that is Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3 says, a man's own folly ruins his life. A man's own what? His own folly ruins whose life? His life. Yet, his heart rages against the Lord. This is what people do, and this is a mistake that people do. Due to their own choices, due to their own decisions, due to all of the things that have caused them pain coming from their own decisions, it's not, and listen, I, you know, if I hear this one more time, I'm going to shout to the Lord, so I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to shout to the Lord. But people say this all the time, well, this must be God's plan. This must be God's plan. This must be God's plan. Oh, so you are walking in complete and total obedience to the Lord so much that that's God's plan? I mean, people don't think about what they're saying. Amen. If you are disobedient to the Lord, you walk outside of the protection of God and he can no longer protect you. Amen. Look, I know in this New Testament church age, we have a hard time with this because we think that forgiveness means we get away with everything. That's not what forgiveness means. God forgave you so that you could build a different life. Amen. God did not forgive you so you could keep on going down the road screwing up. Amen. God forgave you so you could build a new life, become a new creature, and, and walk on God's wisdom and God's word and reap those results. Amen. But people make all kinds of mistakes. People do all kinds of things. I mean, we're here every single Sunday, every single Sunday. I mean, years ago, years ago, it seems like, well, it didn't seem like that long ago, but I know it's years ago, man, we had ice fog and it, uh, on a December morning. We're coming up on the anniversary of that. The reason why I know it is because my Facebook post will come up. But anyways, we had ice fog. I've never heard of ice fog in my life. I didn't even know that ice fog existed. But man, that ice fog was, that was mean stuff. I tried to get out, I tried to come, come to church, hit, hit my truck into a ditch, called someone in the church, they came and helped me, they took me to church. I mean, we had church on that morning. We had church, we're having church. Faith Christian Center is having church. Everybody, turn to your neighbor and say, we're having church. Yeah. Say, if you, got, if you have a question about whether or not we're having church on Sunday, we're gonna be here. We're gonna be here until the rapture and then it's all yours. But we're gonna be here, right? We're gonna have church. See, we have church all the time, but yet people make decisions all the time not to come to church. 
You say, well, I don't belong to, I don't belong to a church. I belong to Christ. Well, who do you think Christ is the head of? And I doubt you're praying five hours a day in your home. These home churches. Home churches. Yeah. Here's, here's a home church. Come to church. It'll make your, be- your home better. That's a home church. Amen. 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 Say, so, well, you're just trying to control people, get people in the door. No, I'm just, we're just trying to bless people. That's all. Because we know that, and, and, and this is true for myself. When I'm sitting over there listening to Pastor Lingerfeld, I'm sitting over there listening to Pastor Austin. Holy Spirit's speaking to me too. How many, how many of y'all have been a Christian for many, many years? Who in here has been a Christian for many, many years? Are you still making changes to your life? Yes. Are you still making tweaks to your life? Yes. Absolutely. It's called following the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? But people do this. They blame God. They blame God. Or they, instead of taking responsibility, what Pastor Lanfield has been talking about, personal responsibility, they blame God or they blame the man of God in life, and it does no good. Tell your neighbor, say, it does no good. Because it doesn't affect the man of God's life. As a matter of fact, we're going to read on and we're going to see that Elijah and the prophets were not living in lack. They were not eating each other's children. As a matter of fact, while Samaria was under siege and while there was famine, Elijah and those who had plenty and more, they had plenty and more than enough. God always takes care of his children. Oh my goodness. If you only take one thing away from this morning, you should know that God always takes care of his children. This society is so crazy. They're doing such crazy things. But you know what? God always takes care of his what? His children. Like Elijah and the ravens, God will provide. And God always takes takes care of his prophets, his men and women. Now let me just throw one more freebie in here for you right here. And that is that connections matter. Who you connect with matters. What were the elders doing? Were they freaking out? No, the elders were with who? They were with Elisha. They were eating. They were eating. Even in a siege, they were still what? Eating. If God has to cause an animal to come die on your front porch, because I know some of y'all never been hunting, including myself. I mean, if God has to cause an animal to come die on your front porch so that, you ha- so that you have food to eat, so be it. Do y'all believe that? Yeah. Oh, since we believe that, we don't care what the world says. We live exactly the way God wants us to live. And there's a big difference between the life that's being lived by those attached to the king versus those being attached to Elisha. Look at verse 32. Now, Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? So Elisha knew he was a what? Murderer. He knew his heart, right? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of the master's footsteps behind him? While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him, and the king said, this This disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, I want you to notice a couple things here. First of all, the man of God lacked no fear. No fear whatsoever. No fear whatsoever. He said, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? But not only did he have no fear, but he was also smart. How many know it's okay to be a Christian and be smart at the same time? What did he tell his messenger? He said, look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. So he was smart. He defended himself, yet he had no what? No fear. So who does the king blame? The king blames God. How unintelligent is that? That's not a way to get answers to your prayers. God, I'm going to blame you, but I'm coming to you. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. That's like my kids coming to me, blaming me for their bad grades. I didn't take the test. I told you to study. I asked you if you studied. You told me, yes, I've studied. But guess what? You didn't study. Any parents know what I'm talking about? Hey, did you do your homework? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did my homework. Then you get an email. 
uh, your son did not turn in his homework. Well, well, we're going to do a little more inspecting next time, right? I mean, we're going to, well, give me your book bag. Let me, let me look into your book bag and see. I mean, I mean my, my kids can't come to me and blaming me for something and then expect to receive from me when I didn't do it to them. Right? Look, I know parents are scared to ground their kids now. I know, I know they think that's going to scar them for life or it's going to cause rage in their heart or whatever, whatever baloney you've been listening to. <laughs> But, but if, if I need to ground my, my teenager and my teenager blames me, guess what's going to happen to the length of the grounding? It's going to increase. Some are like, you ground your, you ground your, yes, I have, I have normal kids. It always concerns me when a parent comes to me and says, my kid never does any wrong. Lord, open their eyes, please. <laughs> Lord, open their eyes now, because they need it to hear it, Amen. right? I mean, you can't, you can't go to God and blame God at the same time. Tell your neighbor, say, you can't go to God, go to God. and blame God, blame God at the same time. How many of y'all know that's just logical? Right? How many of y'all know that's just not logical, right? So what did he do? He blamed God. This disaster is from the Lord. Was it from the Lord? No, it's because they had false idols set up in the temples of God. It's because they were serving other idols. When you serve other idols, God is out. He assumes that you don't want to be connected to him. He assumes that, look, you, you obviously want to go a different path. I'm out. Why should I wait any longer for the Lord? Well, if you're looking for a positive response from the Lord, this is not the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. Here's the way to do it. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. Like David said, I lift up my eyes from the hills. Where does my help come from? Where is my what? Where is my what? Not my trouble. Not my problems. But where does my what? My help come from. My help comes from the Lord. Shout it out. Shout, my help comes from the Lord. Amen. My help comes from the Lord. What? The maker of heaven and earth. What's David saying there? Nothing's too hard for God. He made the heavens. He made the earth. My help comes from him. My help comes from him. My help comes from the Lord. So how to write your own ticket with God? Step one is say it. Everybody say, say it. Say it. Step one, Elijah said it twice. 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Elijah said it first by speaking the word of the Lord. Here's what he said. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a sea of flour will sell for a shekel, and two seas of barley will, will for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? Elijah responded, you will see it with your own eyes, Eli answered Elijah, but you will not eat any of it. First of all, I want you to look here and see that they're not talking about donkey heads anymore. Elijah doesn't say that about this time tomorrow, a donkey head will sell, will sell for a shekel and then a, a, a seed pod will, will, will sell for a shekel. No, now he's talking about flour and wheat. Now, you can cook something with flour and wheat. How many of y'all would prefer flour and wheat over a donkey head and seed pots? I said, how many of y'all would prefer flour and wheat over a donkey head? I should have set it up to where those of you that aren't saying amen, that out, as you walk out the service, we give you some donkey head soup. <laughs> and we give the other person a great big loaf of bread <laughs> with some butter on it. <laughs> like some of that butter that they do at those restaurants like Texas Roadhouse where they put all kinds of good stuff in it. How <laughs> I many of y'all know that's not butter, really? I mean, that's, that's honey or whatever. They, anyways. <laughs> You have to forgive me. Sometimes I get distracted, and then we get right back on point, okay? But I mean, this is a, everybody say, this is a different level. This is a different level. And look, this, I'm telling you, this is where some people 
miss it with God. Maybe your whole life you've been living at a certain level of barely getting by, eating government food, eating two-day-old stuff, and then you come into Faith Christian Center and we say, give your life to the Lord. And we won't be talking about government food anymore. We're going, to we're going to talk about eating where you want, when you want, and paying cash for it. Amen. It's a different level. And really, this is where sometimes people misunderstand Pastor's heart or misunderstand Pastor Austin's heart because whenever, when, everything we do, we are trying to get you to lift up your eyes to what God has available for you. Amen. Just coming off the married couples retreat. We didn't do a married couples retreat at Motel 6 in Grand Prairie. Amen. Now listen, I mean, I've stayed at La Quinta Inn. I've stayed at Holiday Inns. I've stayed at all those places. I've done, I've, I've done it. I've stayed there. That was the level I was at. But how many of y'all know there's a level higher than the Holiday Inn level? Are y'all awake this morning? Amen. Some of y'all maybe have never been in a place higher than the Holiday Inn level. Monday, I had to go get two cars, my car and my daughter's car serviced. And I took my daughter's car to her place, which was one experience, a domestic experience. And then I took my car to the other place, which was a much different experience experience. You know, how many of y'all know when you go to a place, you don't want it to be just tolerated? Right. Like when you, when you go, uh, when they're like, are you going to order, are you really here to order food? Y'all ever walked in somewhere and they're like, are you really here to order food? I thought this was a restaurant. Yes. Have you ever walked into a, you ever walked into a restaurant with a large group? How many would you like, how many, how many, I didn't need a table of eight. <laughs> We'll see what we got. I'm going to know it's much better to be served and waited upon than it is just to be tolerated. Yes. Say, there's a whole nother level. Whole nother level. We're not talking about donkey's heads anymore. Now we're talking about flour and wheat, and we're talking about the real stuff. Amen. Amen. A whole nother level. Don't let anyone convince you. Don't let anyone convince you that there's not a difference between the blessing and the curse. Don't let anyone convince you that there is not a difference between the blessing and the curse. I don't live in, I don't live in the curse. I live in the blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now look, you could sit there and you could judge me and you could judge this place and you could judge everybody in here. But the, here's, the, here's the good news. is I'm not saying it's just for me. I'm not saying it's because I'm special. I'm saying it's because I have committed my life to the Lord and I've committed my life to his word and you can too. God does not show favoritism. This world may judge on skin color. God does not. This world may judge on what neighborhood you're from, but God does not. This world judges on all kinds of things, but God does not. Amen? So Elijah said it once by saying that that's what was going to happen by tomorrow. He said it again, same promise, but this time it's on a negative side. Again, by declaring to his negative officer, the king, who would see, would see God's word come to pass, but he would not eat of it. Look at the very end of verse 2 there. You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elijah, but you will not eat any of it. You will not eat any of it. You may see it, but you won't experience it. You may see it, but you won't have it. You may see it, but you won't enjoy it. You may see it, but others will enjoy it while you do without what a frustrating place to be. What a frustrating place to be. To see it, but not able to experience it. 
Look, I've dealt with teenagers for 25 years, and to be honest, this is some of the most frustrating teenagers I've ever seen, are teenagers that come to church, they know the Word, they hear the Word, they see the Word moving in other teenagers' lives, but they will not get on board with the Word of God in their own personal life, and they don't see it happen in their life, and they get frustrated, and they get mad, and they get upset, and they get angry, and they blame God, just like that king and his officer did. They don't, they don't look at the mirror and say, well, you know what? I probably need to change my attitude. Well, you know what? I probably shouldn't be looking at that on my computer. Well, you know what? I probably shouldn't be listening to that music. Well, you know what? I probably shouldn't be acting like the world and expect something from God. And, and, and you think, and I, I, I've thought before, that you know, hell will be a place where everybody will be in eternal torment and they'll be crying out to God for help. I guarantee you, most of the people in hell are going to be angry at God. They're going to be angry. You think Satan is a happy fellow? He's angry. You know why he's angry? Because not only does he see, see, that's why he doesn't want you to get answers to your prayers, because he can't experience it anymore. That's why he wants to stop you. That's why demons hate you. They can't experience it anymore. They had it. They tasted it. They lived it. But they chose to go against the source. And now they can no longer experience it. What does Psalm, what does Psalm 23 say? I will make you a table in front of your enemies. They will see it, but they will not be able to what? Experience it. You know, so sometimes, you know, in churches today, what are they trying to do? They're trying to dumb things down to make people happy. Listen, I could, we, could, we could dumb things down and we could not tell you the truth and people would still get upset because it's never enough. I mean, I mean, those of you that are my age or older remember I mean, growing up, it was always, you know, all you got to do, all you got to do, all you got to do, all you got to do is let, you know, let homosexuals get married. Let them get married. Then everything will be okay. Everything will be okay. That's all we want. And then, and then that happens, and guess what? Oh, all you got to do is let people be, you know, change the gender of their child. And then, oh, and then that, everybody knows that won't be enough. Then that won't be And now all you want to do is, can I marry my tree? Oh, that, or, or <laughs> can I marry my dog? Or can I, can I marry my cat? You know, because cats are so, you know, so spectacular, you know? You know what's more spectacular than a cat? A real life woman's more spectacular than a cat. That's some lonely stuff, amen? I mean, it's never enough. Tell your neighbor, say, it's never going to be enough. Why? Because they don't want you, they, they see you having the things of God and they're not experiencing it and it frustrates them. It frustrates them. That's probably going to explain a lot of your relatives at Thanksgiving. They're not mad at you. They're mad at the blessing of God on you. If there are any miracles going on, I want in. I said, I, I want in. I just read you four miracles this morning. How many of y'all want in on that? Amen. If there's healing and health going on, I want in. Everybody say, I want in. If there's prosperity going on, everybody say, I want in. And I want my family in. Amen. But a wrong ad, there's a wrong attitude going on in the church today, and that is if your attitude is you won't believe it until you see it, you'll never see it. Because that's not faith. Everybody say, that's not, faith. that's not faith. You can be a part of the miracles going on here at church. Look at verse 2. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? Shout it out loud again. Shout, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. Look at that. Look at the arrogance. The arrogance of this man. Even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, heavens, could this happen? The officer's attitude was the exact opposite of what it should be. His attitude was even if. Even if that happens, it won't work out. Even if this could go on, that won't work out. Even, is your attitude that even if attitude? Is that the type of attitude you had? Well, even if God healed my arm, my leg still hurt. <laughs> even, if God, even if God, you know, got me free from this addiction, I'd probably go right back. 
what? What? How can you think you'll receive anything from the Lord with that attitude? Do you have an even if, to, even if attitude or do you have a fully persuaded attitude? Like Abraham, Romans 4, 19, without weakening his faith, his, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, verse 21, being fully persuaded. Everybody shout out, shout, I'm fully persuaded. I'm fully persuaded. Shout like you mean, shout, I'm fully persuaded. I'm fully persuaded. What was he fully persuaded of? That God had the power to do what he had promised. If you're an even if person, you're not going to experience anything. Well, even if God, even if money comes in to pay my rent, I'm still behind in bills. Even if this happens, even if, even if, no, no, no. Become a fully persuaded. Have the attitude of faith. Believe it before you see it and you will see it. Everybody say, I'm going to believe it before I see it. So I know I'm fully persuaded that I'm going to see it manifest in my life. Amen. Step number two, God did it. Second Kings chapter seven, verse three. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let us go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there, for the Lord had cost. Now, this is what the Lord did. Listen, to, this, is, this is what the Lord does. I'm a Romans 8, 28 guy. And if you don't have Romans 8, 28 memorized, you need to get Romans 8, 28, 28 in your heart. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose in all things. He didn't cause all things, but in all things, God works for the good. God works for the what? The good. You, this, this is what the Lord did. And the Lord has, had caused the Armenians to serve, excuse me, the Armenians to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptians kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. They heard something. Part of the joy of serving God is you know he's going to fulfill what he promised. But you don't know how he's going to do it. And part of the joy of serving God is sitting back and watching, how's God going to do this? Because whatever your small mind can come up with, <laughs> Ephesians 3.20 says he's able to do immeasurably more than all that you could ask or imagine. I got a big imagination, but he can do what? More. Turn over and say, don't limit God. Don't limit God. If God tells you to do something, do it. Even if it seems small to you, do it. Even if it doesn't seem like it's related to what you need, do it. Because God will cause great things to happen. We're going to jump ahead here because the lepers, they get excited. They go into one tent, start eating, getting some bling on. They go to the next tent. They used to keep eating, get some more bling on. And then they realize if they find out about this and we didn't tell anybody, we're dead. So what do they do? They go over and they tell, they, they report it to the royal palace. Look at verse 10. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went to, the, to our remaining camp and there not a man was there, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. Of course, they were a little skeptical, so they sent a team out to double check it. Look down at verse uh, 13. One of his officers answered, have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all the Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them and find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses and the king sent them. So they found out, they followed, uh, they, 
Look down at verse 15. They followed them as far as the Jordan. They found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment that they had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans and so the sea of flour and the sold for a shekel and the two seas of barley sold for a shekel as the Lord had said within 24 hours. Now let me, let me take this one point here and give you an encouragement. Walking by faith can sometimes seem like, seem like, Seem like, feel like, the answer's not there. But within 24 hours, things can change instantly. I can't tell you how many times. Maybe I got a bill that came in. Maybe I have something that I'm dealing with in my, in my own life, and I'm believing God, I'm confessing, man, I'm getting up, I'm confessing, I'm believing, I'm standing on the word, and man, it seems like, it seems like it's, I mean, it seems like nothing's going on. Man, it seems like I'm just like digging in dry, hard ground, and, and I mean, I've tried to shovel before, and dry, hard ground, man, it's impossible. You know, you're hitting it, you're, you get a little piece up, and you flip it off, go, well, that's great, right? I mean, and you're, and, you're, and you're digging down hard, you're trying to dig down hard, but man, I'm telling you, when God comes in, all of the sudden, things change instantly. Instantly. Instantly, things can change. Your life can look completely different 24 hours from now than it does today. Don't give up. Tell your neighbor, say, don't give up. Verse 17, now the king had put the officer on whose, on, on whose arm he leaned and charged the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Just as the man of God had foretold when the king, de- king, ga- uh, excuse me, king came down to his house. It happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a sea of flour will sell for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer had said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? The man of God replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. And that is exactly what happened to him for the people trampled him in the gateway and he died. God confirmed his word he gave to Elijah to speak the word of the Lord, that they would have more than an abundance, that they would go from famine to feasting within 24 hours. The economic situation completely changed. But also, God also confirmed Elisha's declaration that the king's negative officer would see it and would not eat of it, and he died. So step number three, the people received it, and the negative king's officer also what? Received it. So you're going to get it. The question is, are you going to get it in the positive or are you going to get it in the negative? Well, if that's my choice, I'm choosing positive. I said, I'm choosing positive. Anybody else here choosing positive? So step number three, the people received it and the negative king's officer also received it. And step number four, positive or negative, the fruit of your life tells it. The fruit of your life tells it. Proverbs 18, 21, the King James. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who live it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 12, 14. From the, from the fruit of his lips, a man is filled with good things, as surely as the work of his hands rewards him. So the negative king's officer questioned the word of the Lord, and he received what he got. The people, what? Elijah spoke the positive word of God, and what was the result? They received their Miracle. Look, if you don't like your harvest, change your actions and change what you're saying. Amen. Jump in. Jump in. Because you too can receive what God has in store for you. Amen. 